So I came up with a title that I thought would interest you. And then I started talking to all the faculty, and I realized it should have had nanoparticles somewhere in there, because we do actually work with nanoparticles. I have been to uh, Waterloo before once. I gave a talk here, no, literally right here in May. I don't know if any of you were here for the uh, Cirque Summit, but they had 20 or 30 Cirques come, and uh, we, we got to use this room and even got to use some of your other facilities up there. So it's a very nice uh, place, and I think each of you should be proud to, to be at this particular university, especially at this particular time, because there is a huge impact that I think that you can have on society. So let me start my talk by telling you a little bit about myself and my past and try and give you some of the motivation. Because I could stand up here and talk about research uh, and half of you would be bored at any one time during, during that. So I'm going to shoot for a little less boredom and maybe I can tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing. And then at the end, maybe you can see why I personally am excited to be able to do the types of things that I am. By the way, I came to McGill in 2015, January 13th, from Alabama. <laughs> I wanted to get it over with because I knew the weather was going to, to get a lot better from that point on. Tuscaloosa, Alabama, as a matter of fact, is in the southern part of the United States. It's warm. In fact, they're wearing t-shirts right now. Uh, but they're mostly known for American football. Does anybody know American football? Yeah, who's going to win the national championship? You better say Alabama. <laughs> anyway, let me tell you a little bit about green chemistry. I was born the year that Sputnik was launched. So the, some, of the, some of the faculty would recognize when that was. Other of you don't even remember what Sputnik was. But in, when I was two years old, I was born in Fort Lauderdale when I was two. My father took us to Athens, Alabama. Athens was right a small town, and he actually worked in a town called Huntsville, Alabama, starting in 1960. Well, 1960, to be in the center of the universe for science and technology, which was Alabama for rocket science, was an amazing thing to grow up as a high school student knowing that I was going to be a scientist because this, is, this was exciting. We were, going, we were going to the moon. We were developing new products and new things for society, left and right, that had nothing to do with going to the moon, but they were an outcome of that project. In fact, I was convinced by today I would be in space. Now, some people say I am in space, but I was convinced my body would be in space by this time. I was going to be a scientist, and I was going to change the world. And I was supported by society because scientists were the good guys, especially chemists. We helped people. We made medicines. We were educators. We protected the public. So my profession, chemistry, was viewed as a field of innovators, modern medical breakthroughs, modern convenience, new polymers, new plastics, all of the things to help the quality of life. But then, in 1975, I graduated high school, and I drove down to the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa to become a scientist, to become a chemist. But something was wrong. All of a sudden, chemists and scientists were the bad guys. How, how did this happen? I mean, you've seen the movies, but megalomaniacs obsessed with this vision of how we're going to command global respect. By the way, that's true still today. But. <laughs> Somehow that was turned into something that was bad. And so you have to kind of ask yourself, how did chemistry go from being the innovators to being the ones who were fouling the planet? Well, you just have to look at the chemical products of the 20th century to understand that. What makes chemistry unique is that we make things. We make new molecules. We make new chemicals. And by the way, I don't believe there are many, if any, chemistry curricula around North America that teach a field called toxicology while they teach chemistry. I never heard of it when I was an undergraduate. 
So I never knew how tox toxic materials were determined or measured. I never knew how to predict. And so you had all these compounds, incredibly important compounds, including CFCs. If you live in Alabama, you love CFCs. We want to stay cool. But they had unintended consequences. And nobody was studying those consequences. They were making more chemicals to improve the quality of life. And the result of that was a chart like this, which shows an essentially environmental protection laws passed in the US. If you look at uh, this side, which is number of laws and year starting in 1870, the first law which might be considered a, an environmental protection law was one. 1870, and then it progresses at a, a reasonably slow pace until 1970. So why, remember I said 1975 was when I went to school? Look at that shoulder. What caused that? Does anybody know? No, I heard somebody say it. Yeah, so it was a book called The Silent Spring, and this changed the perception of chemicals and chemicals in the environment. And what happened is that you passed law after law after law. It's still going. But there was all of a sudden this idea that the EPA was going to protect society from all these chemicals. The problem with most of the EPA laws is that they have no technical backing. They're not about risk or risk assessment. They're about what is the lowest amount you can measure, and that's what the limit is going to be. So we, as a chemical industry, what was our response? Our response was to make sure nothing got into the environment. So to mitigate risk, we reduced exposure. Well, what's the problem with having something to reduce exposure is that it's going to fail. At some time, you're almost guaranteed, whether it's Fukushima, Three Mile Island, Love Canal, there are going to be failures, and that chemical is going to, or is going to get out into the environment and it's going to cause damage. So this field, green chemistry, came along in the, probably the mid-1990s uh, when Paul Anastas and John Warner were formulating what they called the 12 principles of green chemistry. I think the book came out in 1998 where green chemistry and engineering focus on the design, development, and implementation of chemical processes and products that reduce or eliminate the use and or generation of hazardous substances. You would think that this would be readily adopted by every university in the United States and just taught, even if it's just philosophy, taught to students in chemistry. Watch out for the molecules you make. Worry about their toxicity. Worry about their fate in the environment. Well, it did take off around the world. You may not think that China is clean today, but I do know they're pumping millions of dollars into green chemistry and sustainability. They are at least trying. This was in 2005. Even in Africa, they're worried about green chemistry and sustainability. This meeting was in 2008. But what do you think has been happening in the United States? It's being relegated as a philosophy or a religion rather than a science, rather than something that we should all be aspiring to. But there's a secret here. Because green chemistry is at the start, or chemistry rather, is at the start of most new technologies where you make a new compound, we can have a big influence, even if it's uh, uh, an influence that's uh, uh, covert rather than an in-your-face uh, environmentalist attitude. But in order to do that, we have to find a way to get green chemistry into society in the more general context of sustainability. So everybody today, even my neighbors, now know we have to protect the environment from environmental pollutants, although really CO2 is not, just, is not the only thing that we need to worry about. It is the only thing a lot of people are worrying about. But really, you need to worry about biodiversity, not just climate change, but biodiversity, maintaining the natural resources that we have. So environmental integrity, that's important. Use of natural resources. There's another one that is really becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's social responsibility. 
Uh, we, we have a society looking for economic equity, looking for social justice. You won't be able to exploit somebody and take all their wealth for a, another wealthy country. That's not sustainable anymore. But you know, there's a third leg to sustainability that almost everybody who worries about the environment forgets. You have to make money. If you have a business and you don't make money, you don't have a business anymore. So you have to ask yourself, who's going to take these technologies and move them forward? Who's going to be the sustainable businesses of the future if they can't make money? So I would, as an American, you're probably saying, he's always talking about money. But it's OK, because you have to, you have to know that your government or my government, they're not going to pay businesses to provide products to people. So when you think about sustainability, you need all three in order to be truly sustainable. So we decided that we're not going to wait for, uh, to convince people to go green. We're going to try to invent new green technology. In order to do that, though, it has to be better. And so people will buy it because it's better, not because it's green. You can get a very small segment of the richest part of society to buy things because they're green. But you can get everybody to buy something that's green if it's cheaper and better. And that's, that has to be the motivation for a lot of what we do. But we have a problem. And I've talked with many of you in WIND, and you have the same problem. Industrial adoption of uh, new methods and practices really is based upon cost and demonstration of viability. But it cannot be just as good. It has to be so much better, they're willing to make the huge investment in order to change their entire technology. For example, a chemical plant might have $50 million in physical infrastructure. And you're going to go up there and say, I can save you a dollar a pound if you switch and completely eliminate your plant and build my plant. And they're going to say, no, it's not enough. So green chemistry actually has another side to it. And this is the one where I think green chemistry and sustainability will make a difference. It's not just about making things green and sustainable. It's the fact that if you do, you've generated huge business opportunities for you or your students or students who are here for you to start your own business. I have gone to DuPont and tried to pitch technologies before. And I have had them tell me if I could guarantee them $18 million a year in profit, they'd be happy to listen. I've sat around in a group meeting and asked every one of my students, would you be happy if you could make $1 million? And they each said yes. And that's the opportunity, the smaller entries. You don't, you're not interested in quite as much profit. And a lot of the young entrepreneurs I see today are interested in social change, in making things better. And of course, they don't want to starve. So you have to put it all together. But remember, I'm a professor. How in the world can you have an academic business model? Well, uh, coming from Montreal, I really am supposed to say this in the original French, but I can't just yet, maybe next year. Louis Pasteur had a great quote in 1871. There does not exist a category to which one can give the name applied science. There are science and the application of science bound together as the fruit to the tree which bears it. In reality, a professor doing research has a continuum of research opportunities from the most fundamental of discovery to the most basic of application. What we've tried to do is to take our understanding, which we've built up, which is pretty hard work over a long number of years, and say, where can that understanding change society? Where can we go? So I, I don't see a difference in that type of research. But you'll probably have heard, I'm from Alabama, you'll probably hear that like 100 times. I am. And when I was growing up, I was taught 
in Alabama history, the story of George Washington Carver. Who, know, who knows George Washington Carver in this audience? Excellent. Why do you know George Washington Carver? All right. Got the story. Alabama was a single crop agricultural state, cotton. There was a, this uh, beetle, the boll weevil, which was destroying cotton crops across Alabama and across the South. The entire economy was being wiped out. People were starving. And there was a professor named George Washington Carver at Tuskegee University in Alabama. And he went and he started working with the farmers. He taught them better living habits. He taught them better farming habits. And he taught them alternative crops, primarily the peanut and soybeans. But he did more than that. He created markets for those crops. In his academic laboratory, he invented product after product after product, like peanut butter, peanut oil, soybean oil, all of these products. He must have had 150 patents. What he was doing was working directly with society and those farmers to give them alternatives and to provide markets so that they could survive growing them. Think about that. That was a university that was doing those types of things. So he had uh, over 100 products. It's funny because McGill says McGill invented peanut butter. But I'm, t I'm sticking with my story. He invented peanut butter. Industrial Research Laboratory. He did something else. And this it comes out as in the educator that he was. Since new developments are the products of a creative mind, we must therefore stimulate and encourage that type of mind in every way possible. As a professor, I should be able to do that, at least try to do that at the same time. So in 1998, I started the Center for Green Manufacturing at the University of Alabama. And it was meant to do a lot what you're able to do here, to get scientists and engineers and business people to work together to try and bring technology to fruition. We started an entrepreneurship center and recruited Dr. Dan Daly to come down and do this. Every one of my students at Alabama went through business planning competitions. A lot of them didn't like it, but they had the experience. Others loved it, and that's what they decided to do with their life. At least they were all exposed to, if you develop a new technology, how is it going to get out into the market? We even, just before I left, had taken this down into the high school level in rural Alabama, trying to encourage students to get into this entrepreneurial spirit and look at new technologies. And we started our own companies. The first one was 525 Solutions. It'll be a part of my story later on as I talk to you. But as a professor, I can say that we are not just generating new knowledge. We're generating new companies new technologies, and entrepreneurs at the same time. And not all the students that I want in my lab have to be professors. I wouldn't mind taking the student that never wanted to teach in their life, but wanted to do something different. And by the way, those of you looking for jobs up there, remember, job market is pretty tight sometimes. There are other ways if you create your own job. And that's another, another part of the story. But also, we decided, hey, we're not just going to raise money and do anything. Let's do this all with a view towards making an impact on society. So where can you make an impact on society? Energy, water, materials, and medicine. That part, at least, is not rocket science. Maybe making a contribution might be. So now, back to some, to some chemistry. I should have used a Blackberry, but this slide was made while I was in Alabama. I look at the area of research that I do as knowledge to application. That knowledge can go into almost any application. Just as an example, and you don't have to read it, it's just for, more for general areas. I won't get to talk about it today, but we make active pharmaceutical ingredients in a form that no one has ever seen before. We do nuclear chemistry and actinide chemistry. And if any of you get to 
review my discovery grant. It's really great science. <laughs> We also work with the Air Force to develop uh, liquid energetic materials. And the one I'm going to talk to you about today, which everybody seems to be talking about around the world, what do you do with biomass? How many of you have heard of ionic liquids? That's it, really, I'm disappointed. Ionic liquids and nano are huge. Anyway. If you've heard about ionic liquids in any of the 50,000 papers published from 1995 forward, you would know that an ionic liquid is toxic, expensive, will never get out of the university lab, and green and edible and also biosourced. Yeah, there's some problems, right? But anybody knows that, just ask them. What's an ionic liquid? It's a salt. It's a liquid salt. It could be anything. The definition by the community, I still laugh at it, but I, I use it. A salt which melts below 100 degrees is defined as an ionic liquid. Above that, it's a molten salt. So if you take sodium chloride and you melt it, you get a liquid. It's a molten salt. But if you design your ions and pick them appropriately, you can find salts that melt below 100 degrees not just below 100 degrees, many of them are liquid at room temperature and for all practical purposes look just like water. So Sir William Bragg said a long time ago, the important thing in science is not so much as to obtain new facts as to discover new ways of thinking about them. If you have a new way of thinking, it can completely change the way you do your research and the problems that you tackle. So what was it about ionic liquids? It wasn't that they were liquid salts, it's that they were liquids at room temperature, a whole series of liquids that nobody had ever tested for their solvent properties. So the idea was use them as solvents. <clears throat> It just so happened that many of them, this is a ionic liquid on the right, are non-flammable and non-volatile, whereas something like ethanol will burn. It was also not, not usual to have a salt which would be immiscible with water. This is, the one, this is where I started. That's why I like this one. Imagine you have a liquid salt and water and they phase separate. So I did separations forever. The first thing I did is try to separate stuff. And that was our first paper. Find a liquid salt not miscible with water and do separations. And for you young people, if you can find something that nobody else has done and it's dead easy, that's the best. Just do those. So this idea really took off from uh, I think uh, Ken Seddon had some work in the mid-90s. c &E News started publishing uh, articles on solvents that might replace VOCs. And that was the connection between ionic liquids and green chemistry. That connection took both fields forward, ionic liquids and green chemistry, even though there's some tension there today. The idea behind ionic liquids was this principle of green chemistry. If you're going to use a solvent, if you're going to use one, you shouldn't use one, but if you are, make sure it's innocuous. Well, 74% at the time, 74%, no, 68% of the toxic inventory release of chemicals to the environment at the time came through volatilization. So what if you had a solvent that did not volatilize and you eliminated that pathway. Wouldn't that be a good thing? So in 2000, I co-organized uh, with Ken uh, a NATO advanced research workshop. And if you don't know those, you get to pick the location. I'd never been to Greece, so I thought this would be a great place to have it. It was in Crete. It was called Green Industrial Applications of Ionic Liquids. We got the entire world supply of people working in the field together. That constitutes about the first row. And a few other people to try to convince them to work in the field. And we sat around and we discussed it and we published the outcomes of this in, in a NATO book. There were two major outcomes. The first one is the academic 
you can clearly get it. Ionic liquids, they're just interesting. We should study them. The second one I feel some responsibility for, and you'll have seen it from when I started the Center for Green Manufacturing. Combined with green chemistry, a new paradigm in thinking about synthesis in general, ionic liquids provide an opportunity for science, engineering, and business to work together from the beginning of the field's development. I submit, and I'm going to get shot, I know, if nanotech had adopted this from the beginning, nano would be even further along than it is today. You wouldn't have to go back and check toxicity and all of the green aspects of things. But anyway, this got misinterpreted. It got misinterpreted and published as ionic liquids are green. But if you have a definition as wide as any salt that melts below 100 degrees, you all know that there are going to be some which are deadly toxic and others which aren't. But apparently people don't think very much. So I got the opportunity to publish extremely highly cited papers that I put under the category Mythbusters because I just got tired of hearing it. I would reject paper after paper after paper for making such statements. One statement, ionic liquids are not flammable. Well, I had already been working with the Air Force for nine years to make a replacement for hydrazine, a non-volatile liquid propellant. You guys can come on down. Don't worry. I won't take off points. <laughs> and I knew that they would burn. So I said, OK, take these compounds, write up a chemcom saying ionic liquids burn. And, <laughs> and that's it. And it was accepted. And then all of a sudden, ionic liquids are flammable and explosive. I don't know. But this was probably one of the best ones. Nature, 2005, solvents with environmentally friendly reputation kill fish. That reads, ionic liquids are toxic. This is nature, right? So to put it in plain English for chemist, I always use this slide. Benzene is carcinogenic. Therefore, solvents are carcinogenic. How many of you would let that be published in JAX, Nature, Science, Angevin Chemie, virtually every high-ranking journal you can think of? A chemist should not, but they did. On the other hand, what about water is green, therefore all solvents are green? You wouldn't publish that one, but you would if you were an ionic liquids person trying to hype your work so that people would uh, publish it in a high-ranking journal. That's the problem with the field. That's why ionic liquids are toxic and expensive and an academic curiosity, green, edible. Because people don't think. They're chemicals. And as a chemist, it's easy for me to understand they can have any property I want. And that's the key understanding. They can have any property I want. I'm not going to buy some ionic liquid that somebody made and wants to find uses for it. I'm a chemist. I can make salts. I may not be a good organic chemist, but I can buy organic ions and combine them. So I think ionic liquids are a platform strategy to get different chemical and physical, and I will add biological activity, together in different ions, brought together in different ways. And that little, it, it's simple when you think about you're, you're using a salt. But remember, organic chemists and chemistry in general normally thinks about molecules, one thing. I think about salts a minimum of two, minimum of two. So I feel like I can do anything because I have a parent cation and anion. The first is the design or the selection of what these are going to be independently. And then as a chemist, I could modify each one, but that modification would be independent of the other ion. And then I can bring them together and I can make something that has been designed for a specific purpose. So to me, ionic liquids are magic. And they're magic because they allow me to think differently. And when somebody comes up to me and says, I tried that 20 years ago. It didn't work then. It's not going to work today. All I have to do is ask them a, one or two questions. And ultimately, they will realize, no, they didn't do it. And yes, it could work.
It's not that simple, but I try. I actually think they're game changers. I'm a separation scientist, so let me talk to you about some of the separations. Actually, I say that with some jest because I'm also apparently a drug developer and a materials chemist and engineer. Most people think I'm a chemical engineer. I'm a chemist. Let's look at another principle of green chemistry. A raw material or feedstock should be renewable rather than depleting. Y'all know what that means, right? Make corn into ethanol. Well, I hope you don't take that, uh, I hope you didn't take that seriously, but there are certain things like pollutants are all about CO2, renewables are all about ethanol. I actually find that to be a little funny. So third Alabama reference. In Alabama, we know how to take corn and make it into ethanol. We've done it for hundreds of years, but we drink it. We don't actually burn it in our car. <laughs> today, all of this attention, and you've seen it, uh, first it was cellulose and trees, and today now it's lignin because they figured, oh yeah, trees actually have lignin in them too. But it's all about uh, these decreased crude oil reserves, enhanced demand for fuels, the climate, climate uh, concerns, so lignocellulosic biomass is out there. Do you know how much cellulose is made by nature compared to the total chemical inventory made by all the world's chemical industries? Well, I can, let's see if I can remember it now. <laughs> it takes two days for nature to make the tonnage of cellulose that the entire world's chemical industry takes a year to make. This is an underutilized resource, no question about it. So why are ionic liquids suitable? This is my only solvent application of ionic liquids. It's the only one that I think makes sense today. Biomass, the grand challenge. Everybody is, uh, I've got it, that's why I want to go to that grand challenge thing and, and look at it. It has three major biopolymers, lots of other valuable chemicals, but let's just look at a tree, for example. About 44% cellulose, hemicellulose, which is covalently bonded to lignin, and by the way, there is no formula for lignin. It's something that has a bunch of these in it, but there's no one formula for lignin, and that's part of the problem with its chemistry. So in Canada, how do you get cellulose from all your wonderful trees? It's the same in Alabama. We compete on the tree scale. Our trees grow faster, though. In the craft process, you use incredibly high temperatures and caustic, and you create and you essentially destroy the lignin and hemicellulose matrix around the cellulose, and you get a pulp. And if the pulp has too much lignin in it, you pump it with more chemicals to destroy the chromophores and lignin until you get a bleached pulp. And we call that cellulose. And the pulp and paper industry has used that for a long time. How many of you have ever lived near a paper mill? Yeah, me too. Tuscaloosa. It's awful. <laughs> you can smell, especially when you get an inversion and that cloud comes down into your home and it gets in all your clothes. It's not pretty. It's a very bad process. But let me tell you what they get. They get a pulp, which here is the percentage of biomass of what went in. So they, they take the tree pulp, the tree, and then they pulp it, and they get a certain percentage, and then they measure the lignin content. I want you to remember that the process is chemical degradation of all the polymers around cellulose, never touching cellulose. Do you know why they do that? Because nothing dissolves cellulose, right? That's the thinking. So you get this box, and normally it, the pulp is somewhere in here, and you have to bleach it. Ideal would be here. Perfect separation, right? 44% cellulose, zero lignin, that would be perfect. So in about, uh, well, in 2002, we actually found a solvent, an ionic liquid, that dissolves cellulose directly. I'll, I'll show you some of the things we can make from that later. But people kept asking us, you can dissolve cellulose, can you dissolve trees? And he said, well, I've never, decided, I've never tried to dissolve a tree. But in 2006, we did, and we found out the answer was yes. The first uh, full-scale paper was published in 2009, I think, uh, where we took pine, 
our fast growing trees, ground them up, treated them in one step with an ionic liquid, and we separated a lignin fraction, which is not craft lignin, this is lignin, and a cellulose rich material that had both cellulose and a little bit of hemicellulose in it. And what we found is in one step, we got pretty darn close. We didn't have quite as high a temperature, we were in 100 degrees, we didn't have the time, and we had only one chemical. And we dissolved the cellulose in the process. We then did some engineering optimization studies, still not done, but we did the simple things like, well, what happens if you raise the temperature above the glass transition of lignin to make it more mobile and hopefully more soluble to allow it to come out? If you do that, you're getting better. Just the first modification. But then, as a chemist, I couldn't help it. I said, well, lignin probably is not coming out because it's covalently bonded to hemicellulose by beta O4 linkages. Why don't I try to clip those with some catalyst? And so we looked around and Craig Hill at Emory had been looking at polyoxometalates for delignification. That's a good catalyst. It destroys lignin if you leave it in there long enough. But we asked the question, what if we just left it in there a little bit? So we did catalytic cleavage of lignin with polyoxometalates. And what we found in going after those uh, oxygen linkages is that we have control. We can go anywhere in that phase space that we want. In fact, if we wanted to, we could depolymerize in situ the lignin, the hemicellulose, and the cellulose so that we had all soluble polymers. At the time, we didn't think that was a good idea because we wanted to use the polymers. But seeing how much people are going crazy for any chemical from biomass, we're going to go back and we'll do it again. But you now have control. That means you can engineer a process for pulping where you separate the individual polymers without degrading them much. Some of them you degrade more than others, like the lignin. You simply take the ionic liquid, the catalyst, put it in a solution with the wood, separate first the cellulose material, mostly cellulose, with acetone water. You then evaporate the acetone and the hemicellulose fraction comes out. And then you can actually separate two different uh, water, so water insoluble and acid insoluble lignin fragments. That to me is the basis for developing polymers directly from biomass rather than just chemicals. You can also think about doing this one step further. If you want every type of chemical, what about the extractives? An ionic liquid is not volatile, the ones we use. The ionic liquids we use are not volatile. So if you distill out anything that's distillable, you have another easy separation of chemicals at that point. So you have the biomass in solution, you distill out anything that will distill, and you're left with the biopolymers, which I just showed you how you can separate those. In doing this, we demonstrated uh, the separation of limonene from oranges. Uh, I think we were more efficient than the traditional uh, process. Not as cheap. <laughs> I guarantee you we're not as cheap. But you can really now think of a biorefinery as it should be thought of. Every single product, product after product after product, that can come out of that tree, or agricultural waste, or fishing waste, or hair, sheep wool, chicken feathers, virtually any biomass that contains biopolymers, we can dissolve. And that allows you a lot of flexibility for chemicals. So here's what we did. We decided, well, nobody's going to give us money because they're going to say this is a business. So we wrote a small business innovation research grant to the Department of Energy. And we told them, we were going to fractionate biomass. We were going to make small reactors. We were going to take them to the farmer wherever they needed to go. If they needed to scale up, they were going to number up instead of scale up. I was thinking sales would be pretty good at that point. And it would work. And we got $150,000 for nine months to demonstrate the concept. And we met every single milestone, every single one. It was great. So we applied for phase two. Phase two is 
$1.5 million for two years to build the prototype and to have everything ready for investment. <laughs> they rejected it. They rejected it. It was perfect. I mean, I said, DOE, you, your grand challenge. We're doing what you told us to do. Do you know why they rejected it? Ionic liquids are toxic. Ionic liquids are expensive. And it was rejected. So I said, OK, some things you can't fight. So maybe I just need a better business model. I have to stop thinking like a professor and start thinking like a business person. It is difficult. I'm still not sure that I can do it. What's the better business case? All right, we're going to take you on chemical industry. What really is green chemistry? Elimination of the chemical industry. Now, they're not going to support me for this, but I want to ask you, really, what is the big success in sustainable chemicals today? It's a polymer they use in water bottles called polylactic acid. And people buy it. How many of you have bought the, the water bottle from Denasi with the little green leaf on it? It's got polylactic acid in it. Nobody? OK. Somebody's got to have bought it. Maybe you're paying more and you don't know it. The chemistry is to get a polymer from nature. And because we're chemists, it's to somehow get that polymer into a monomer. And because we're the chemical industry, to sell that chemical to somebody who will make a polymer out of it and make a water bottle. It doesn't make sense. We are only doing renewable chemicals from nature as replacements because we're trying as an industry to fill the markets we already have. What we need to be doing is we need to be going from the tree to the water bottle in one step without any covalent modification. So we need to start thinking about the replacement of function. The function is to carry water, not to make a polymer. So how do we, you know, unless we invent, you guys might do it in, in WIN, invent the anti-gravity container that carries water, and I won't have to worry about polyethylene terephthalate anymore. But in the meantime, I'm going to try to see if we can get, make a better water bottle. Think about all the polymers in nature. Chitin cellulose, lignans, keratins, collagens, all sorts of biopolymers out there that have high value. So what if you had any biomass source and you could get a high pure molecular weight polymer in one step just by extraction and you had the ability to dissolve that polymer, wow, I'm late, <laughs> to dissolve that polymer and form any type of material that you wanted. Fibers, beads, films. You could add nanoparticles, which we have, by the way, and you could encapsulate them in any of these biopolymer architectures. This was the original discovery. This is filter, Wattman filter paper cellulose. It's dissolving directly in an ionic liquid in real time. It's a dissolution. We have proven that. It's not a reaction. And to get it back, all you have to do is add water or ethanol or an anti-solvent which outcompetes the hydrogen bonding in the cellulose. But depending upon how you make it, you can make different architectures. For example, this was a nanoparticle. We can make conducting fibers simply by suspending the nanoparticles in the cellulose solution and then pulling it in a, a fiber. We can make drug delivery beads, uh, nano beads of uh, cellulose. Somebody said chitin. I'm going to come back to the, to, to the chitin project here in a moment. Uh, and you can have drug delivery agents from a natural polymer. Very easy, very easy chemistry. How many of you remember photographic film? Yeah. What was it made of? Cellulose acetate. Do you know why it was made out of cellulose acetate and not cellulose? Because everybody knows cellulose doesn't dissolve in anything. They had to make the acetate to get it soluble in the organic solvents to make the film. But in our case, whoops, I lost one here. Uh, it was a good one. I guess it's going to take a while. 
Yep, here we go. This one down here. That is taking cellulose, stirring it up in an ionic liquid, laying it on a sheet, washing it with water. You have a cellulose film. That gives you a lot of flexibility because not only can you control the architecture, a lot of things dissolve in ionic liquids. A lot of active ingredients, uh, nanoparticles don't dissolve, but they're easily suspended. So you can make homogeneous composites. Other polymers dissolve together in the same ionic liquid, so you can make polymer composites as well. And there are some polymers which maybe have higher values. So I'm back to the business case. And the higher value polymer here is chitin. Do you know where chitin comes from? You know, my green chemistry class answers more than y'all do. How many of you remember the movie Forrest Gump? You know that was Alabama? <laughs> That's Bayou La Battery right there. In 2010, there was a pretty bad oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. It shut down the shrimping industry in Alabama for a long time. And we went down there to talk to them and find out what they were doing. And what we found is that they were throwing away their shrimp shells and they were paying $100,000 a month to landfill their shrimp shells. So they built this huge facility, spent $10 million to dry it so they could grind it up and sell it for pennies a kilogram as a fertilizer. And I was remembering papers that I had seen of chitin sutures that you would pay $60,000 a kilogram for and thinking, what if we could extract the chitin? Chitin is incredible. Biocompatibility, this is why it's used in medicine. It's antimicrobial, not very toxic and renewable. It's used in like 300 different applications, low value like food up to high value as in anything to do with medical delivery. It's a $63 billion worldwide market. And yet, there is not a single producer of chitin in North America. Do you know why? It's incredibly polluting. It is a high chemical, high demand process that we can't permit and is not viable. You start with the crustacean shell, and you demineralize it with acid, high acid and temperature. You then have to deprotonate, get the proteins out with high caustic and temperature, and you get something called practical grade chitin, which you can buy today from a variety of sources. If you want to use it in medicine, a further purification step to get something called pure chitin. Not only is the process dirty, but every single chemical step is really chemically intensive, so the polymer gets smaller and smaller and smaller through the whole process. What if you could take that same crustacean shell, treat it with an ionic liquid, and extract in one step a high molecular weight, high purity chitin? We did that. And that's what one of the things that we found that was exciting. Uh, we use uh, industrial microwave tunable to lower the energy and we have microwave dissolution which you pour into water, you wash it with water and ultimately you get a pure chitin without the proteins, without the salts and anything there. One, essentially one step to get it out. Just to show you what value that might have, our first application was in uranium from seawater extraction. You may laugh about that but we were, I told you I worked in actinide chemistry. The Department of Energy had a program to extract uranium from seawater. And I talked to the program officer and the other people, and they were, they were using a high-grade plastic, which they had irradiated so they could put their sorbent on it. And I was in some of the meetings, and I said, do you really want to put plastic in the ocean? You know it's going to break away. The ocean doesn't handle plastic. And they said, oh, not to worry. To make it stronger, we're going to use Teflon. I said, Teflon in the ocean. You're going to be crucified. Just give me a little money, and I'll show you that I can use a polymer from the ocean, and I can outperform you. And so what we did is that we took the waste shrimp shell, we dissolved it, but now instead of spinning as I showed you before, we developed electro spinning. Uh, which can only be done with the high molecular weight polymer. And it couldn't be done with what we bought. And we got a very high surface area mat with the integrity of chitin. 
and we treated the surface to make chitazan on the surface only and put our extractant on <clears throat> and we were able to extract uranium. So we went back and we tried again. Went to the DOE and wrote a small business grant and said, all right, we're ready, let's scale this up. They gave us $150,000 or so uh, to do this process and it was pretty, pretty interesting process. Uh, we only had a few months in order to get this done. Oh, it's only $100,000. We did everything. We really did. We, we proved the concept. We knew exactly what we needed to do. And so we applied for a phase two, one and a half million dollars for two years. But we had a problem because they give you business advice. And so the business advisor was calling us up and said, how much are you going to charge, uh, how much are you going to charge to extract uranium from the ocean? I said, we're not extracting uranium from the ocean. So, oh, well, how much are you going to charge to the, how much are you going to charge for your sorbent for the people who are going to extract uranium from the ocean? And I said, I don't believe really anyone will ever extract uranium from the ocean. If they do, the government's going to pay them to do it many years in advance. So he got really frustrated with us and I said, okay, we'll just write our own business plan. So our business plan this time was, look, you may never extract uranium from the ocean, but if you do, we'll be ready because we're going to take this process and we're going to make product after product after product. We will develop a chitin economy and that will support all of the research that we need to be ready when you come to us asking us for that sorbent. So everything worked. What do you think they said on phase two? Actually this time they bought it, really. So we did get the one and a half million dollars this time and we are able to do exactly what we said. We are scaling this up. We now know what it'll cost to build the plant on the coast of Alabama. This is the team and they're all kind of working together to try and make it work. But there's another portion of that and that's the other products we promised to make. Well, I'm not going back to commodities. Commodities won't work go for the value in polymers, high value, and tailored biomaterials. We can dissolve alginate, which is used in bandages. We can dissolve chitin, chitazan, which is used in bandages. What if we could dissolve them together and make a unique material and make a wound healing bandage fiber? And we've done it. It, it looks uh, just like the other fibers. We've tested it for wound healing. We can make all sorts of other materials. We can make chitons for drug delivery. We can put your nanoparticles in almost any form that you want for any purpose that you want as a carrier. We did get another phase one for the bandages, so it's working slowly, very, very slowly, but it's working. So these two, uh, Dr. Garo and Dr. Shamshima, have also started a company called Chitinality so that they can just run with it and make any chitin product that they want to make. But that leaves me to the end and I'm going to finish. It won't take more than an hour uh, to tell you why I'm here, not in Waterloo but in Canada, why I would come in January. And it's this idea of a green quest. It is a long way and coming in January is uh, not necessarily pleasant. But it's this idea. We can change the economy of anywhere we're at by developing new businesses that are transformational and replace the older ones. Canada doesn't have too many of the older ones left. What if Canada had all of the newer ones and they were here using our resources? So we said, okay, we're going to Canada. Let's do things that are important to Canada. Let's look what has the biggest economic impact for Canada and Quebec. Pharmaceuticals, we do that. Fisheries, I just showed you why we did that. Pulp and paper, oh yeah. Agriculture, mining, aerospace materials, we have work, published work in every single one of those areas. Agriculture, for example, we have a new herbicide on an, of an ionic liquid that uh, we just got a, uh, we've been working with Monsanto and they're going to fund our work up here. It's not volatile, it's not water soluble, so it doesn't drift. We solved market pain and we can have a new form that nobody else has thought of before. We do drug development. 
Uh, it's just go to a pharma person and tell them you want to make a pharmaceutical in the form of a liquid salt, and you see their eyes glaze over because they've never heard of it. They don't understand it, but when they do, it's amazing the opportunities that come from that. I already told you about some of the chitin applications, but let me just uh, look at this one. Forestry, uh, market potential of $130 billion, chemicals and fuels. This is why people go after the biorefinery. Huge markets, not easy markets to get into since most are commodities, which is still one of the problems. But I think the main problem is a business has to be focused on one product. And that product has to show a profit in order to get investment. But I'm a professor, and you know, professors have to show nothing. So we can do what we want. If we could develop a portfolio of prod products, maybe 100, 200 products, the combined total value of such an effort would get people's attention. Because we can make all sorts of polymeric materials. The first step for me is simply take any biomass and make a continuous process to make all of these polymers and then have people working in the lab and inventing. Sort of like the old AT&T Bell Labs. What would you make? Why would you make it? No, you don't have to give me a business case. Why would you make it? Why would it be important? Make it. Demonstrate it. So as part of our uh, process for scale up, we've gone from three liters to 20 liters. This is still at Alabama, but this is what I'm trying to build at, at McGill. We've made it a continuous process. We have an industrial microwave. So we now have a continuous flow dissolution process. It's hooked up to our homemade uh, electro spinning apparatus. Probably looks like no electro spinning you've ever seen because we can't do electro spinning like it's normally done because the ionic liquids we use are not volatile. So we have developed uh, new electro spinning techniques in order to make this work. So discovery and applications, that's what I want to do. I don't want to have to make a business plan for everything. I do not want to replace chemicals in use today. I want to replace the function that those chemicals may have served in their final form at some point. Don't target replacements because you have to compete on their terms. But if you have something new like the iPhone, you don't have to compete with anybody. You create the new market. You create the new function. You find innovative uses for these things. And since it's sustainable, you don't stop with the polymers. You also look at microbial and chemical degradation. And you look at what do you get? You're not targeting anything. You're looking for what you get and how you can use it. And if, if you combine an automated toxicological screen into this process, you can then focus on those chemicals and products which you know at least initially show low toxicity profile. So I think we can do it. New technologies that are environmentally, economically, and socially sustainable. Even if we don't, we still get new knowledge, new companies, and entrepreneurs along the way. It's already started. The group is very small. I have lots of openings. I just not pointed to you guys down here. Back there. I have lots of, op <laughs> lots of openings. We've started a company in name only so far. I hope the French is right, but it is supposed to be something like Green Quest, not Don Quixote type quest. This is uh, one of the labs as far along as I've ever seen it. This was yesterday. <laughs> Actually, this, this is going to be the first lab. I did not pick that green color. You know it would have been red if I'd chosen it. Uh, but we are installing. This, this was Monday. Uh, this was our first uh, diffractometer, which is going into place. So it's working. The next steps, I can't do it alone. I never could do it alone. I never expected to do it alone. Because if we are going to be sustainable, every one of your disciplines and all the ones that you can think of are going to be required. This was in, uh, I think it was science, yeah, science in February. Systems integration, 
global sustainability challenges from maintaining biodiversity to cleaner air, they're not done in a vacuum. Everything touches everything else. So I know y'all have people doing life cycle assessment. That's a start. Don't focus just on CO2. That's a start. But we have to look at sociology. We have to look at public policy. We have to look at behavioral patterns in addition to what we normally think about. And that's what's hard. But I will tell you one thing. Global climate change could very well be the boll weevil. And when it's destroying economies around the world and people are starving, I hope we're ready. So as a professor, I get to make sure that I at least try to get us ready. And I don't have to follow what everybody else says. Most of them are wrong. I have to be aware, be aware and be able to look into the future that I have no clue what it's going to be and anticipate. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you very much for your attention. Sure. I, I, I'm happy to go on for hours. Uh, are there any questions for Dr. Rogers? Toxic. So you demonstrated that you can uh, extract many things with the added liquids. So that when you say that you have extraction, you can separate the good stuff, but then the added liquid must get uh, separated with the bad stuff. How is it to remove the bad stuff from the added liquid? So there's two parts. It's a good question. And I'm going to tell you, though, that I'll change the premise a little bit. There should be nothing bad. You must use everything. You absolutely must find a use for everything, or else you're just generating more waste. But the main question uh, I would have expected from the engineers, not from a chemist, but the main question is, how do you make sure that you can reuse your ionic liquid and recycle it? Because that's going to be a major contributor to the economics. Well, technically, it's not hard because you boil off the water, you're done. Technically, that's not hard. We can recycle that as many times as we want to. Economically, that's a disaster. So we have to find better ways to recycle the ionic liquid, or we can do separations. We can extract. We can precipitate if we want to. If you have, say, say cellulose and lignin, so you extract, you get the cellulose out, but then the lignin inside the ionic liquid. Oh, you missed that part. OK, that one was important. There's a separation process for sequential separation of the polymers. That really is a, a very big key. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that one. Make sure that I didn't go through that part too fast. Just focusing on the polymers. At this step, we have found at least the first solvent combination that will precipitate all of the cellulose while leaving the others in solution. If you then uh, evaporate the acetone from this mixture, you'll precipitate the hemicellulose. So you're doing a fractional separation polymer by polymer. And the last step here is you can get a water insoluble and an acid insoluble lignin. It's still not, it's still not pure and clean, but you're getting the bulk or the majority of each polymer sequentially. In fact, I can tell you, if Lignin and hemicellulose were not covalently bonded, this would be trivial because I have taken the three polymers, mixed them together, very easy to dissolve together, very easy to separate. That's how we came up with the separation process here. Uh, it's not perfect, no way. Uh, so the, the key is how would we clean up the ionic liquid? But there's another secret. Yeah, I should have put that in here. It goes like this. Maybe I put it in the other one, I'm not sure. Yep. Yes, here. So the ionic liquid goes back into the process after recycle. This is a magic step. That one is going to be hard. That one is hard from an economic point of view. Technically, it's not hard. Economically, that's a hard step. So we'll, we'll be looking a lot at that particular step. But the other thing I wanted to let you all know, if you have any experience with ionic liquids, don't believe that ionic liquids have to be pure. Don't believe that they have to be 100% pure, 100% dry. It's simply not true. I can use a black 
technical grade mixture of ions with up to maybe 10% water and it will still do what I need it to do. It'll still dissolve the cellulose, the lignin, and the hemicellulose. And no uh, industry that I know of out there in bulk chemicals uses pure solvents, too expensive. So recycling, will, it will put stuff in there, but if, as long as it doesn't interfere with the process, they'll just carry through. Ultimately, I may have to replace it. That'll be expensive. Flora? You can't ask a question. I choose to use uh, ethyl methylamidazolium acetate because that ionic liquid has been registered uh, by BASF and DEGUSA in Europe under REACH legislation and it has been labeled non-toxic. And BASF and a few other companies in Germany can scale it up, already have it at 100 ton scale. So yes, I've chosen that one. Many people around the world picking others, uh, ultimately they're going to have to do the toxicology and the, and the scale up and everything else. So for me, this one works. That's what I want to use. And I also have a patent to make a little cheaper version. So what is the cause of that compared to some people who use sulfuric acid and all these type of materials? No one will use sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid to do what I do because it'll destroy the cellulose. It'll chop it up. You'll have acid hydrolysis. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that I, and I tried to emphasize it at the beginning. This is a dissolution. It's like you put sodium chloride in water. You remove the water, you have sodium chloride. There's no reaction. You take cellulose under most conditions. You put it in the ionic liquid, you remove the water, you have cellulose. There's no chemical reaction. No reduction in molecular weight, if you do it right. Yes? Broader range of biomass, right? Because a tree to get to be a good usable size, right? 40, 50, 60 years. Really? That's a lot. <laughs> it's eight years in Alabama. Yeah. Um, this is the question had to do with the feedstock. This process is feedstock agnostic. I choose trees because I started with them with pine, and I choose trees up here to start with because everybody goes, wow, in Canada if you say trees. But I can use uh, canola husk. I can use uh, almost any lignocellulosic biomass that's out there. So when they're, those companies are out there just taking the corn to make ethanol, I'm going to be taking the rest and making money. Uh, what's the solubility of what? The cellulose solubility depends upon the molecular weight uh, in terms of uh, how much you can get in there. Uh, with emim acetate, we've gotten 30% with a, a commercial pulp, 30 weight percent of cellulose with a commercial pulp. Uh, the solubility to me is not real, the real driver, but it is, it's pretty high. Yes? Uh, this is about your concept of a, a green class. How would you look about changing the economy of places such as Saudi Arabia that are heavily dependent on fossil fuels? I have different, uh, you know, different goals for places like Saudi Arabia. I think the problem there really is water and reducing the, the energy demand. So I would, I would probably go after changing the economy by making it a water-rich country. And if you do that, then you totally change the economics for agriculture and irrigation and everything else. So you, you have to kind of look at where this would work. If you just want native biomass, for example, you can go into Africa right now. So sure, it won't, you won't be able to, uh, to do this in, play, in the middle of a desert where there's no biomass. But there are things that you could do to make sure there is no desert. And so you, you might look at that problem a little bit differently. Anybody working on water? Y'all have a big water center here. That's, a, that's another real big one. 
Is that what you were asking? So get it out. What was the real question? What, what should I be answering? OK. Yeah, this is a great question. What do you do with the waste from the, the shrimp shell? Um, proteins from the shrimp shell is actually very high value. There's something called pink liquor, uh, you can imagine. Uh, but this, ha this has a lot of value in fertilizer. So one use that we had thought of is that they're banning uh, a bromide uh, fumigant in uh, insecticide in California. And if we have a, a liquid version of this, it'll go through the drip irrigation. And you may be able to replace the fumigant by just adding it to the irrigation. And what it does in the plus plus category is it gives you nutrients. So it's also a fertilizer. So it has that uh, insecticide fertilizer combined in one. So I would look for market opportunities like that. Have any of you heard of liquid worms? No? So. If you get a chance to go into direct consumer market, that's where you should go. So the product are worms that have been ground up into a liquid. And it's a fertilizer. And it's very expensive if you buy it from Lowe's or Home Depot. But people buy it to fertilize their, their garden with. Uh, and it's kind of the same. You're seeing more and more uses for the proteins from anything. You have to have some economic way to ship and prepare and do them. The calcium uh, carbonate market, I don't know, that's not a very high value right now. So we'd, have to find, we'd have to find a market for that too. Oh, starch is easy, yes. I have a couple of papers on, uh, actually, I've used ionic liquids a different way. It's a funny story. Uh, it's only take half an hour. I have a collaboration in Australia doing starch. And they wanted to compare an ionic liquid because we, we have published papers on ionic liquids as plasticizers, particularly antimicrobial plasticizers for medical plastics. So they wanted to evaluate our ionic liquid for starch plasticization. And they wanted to compare it to glycerol. And they were getting these strange results because they were putting their plasticizing agent in there by, to as much as 20 or 30 percent. And they were getting things that they didn't understand. And I had to tell them, you're dissolving the starch. So the, the ionic liquid will plasticize. But what's the ultimate plasticization you can think of? Just make it totally mobile. Starches will work. Yep. Thank you.